welcome to Artificiality, brought to you by the founders of Saunders Studio. Artificiality is a podcast dedicated to understanding the emerging community that is humans and machines. We take the latest in the human side, decision science, psychology, and design, and put it together with advances in artificial intelligence and big data so that you can understand how to work better with machines and your fellow humans. We founded Saunders Studio to help people be more human in the age of AI. We're on this learning journey too, so we strive to find the frontiers, to ask the best questions, and stay curious. We interview some of the top minds working at the intersection of humans and machines, and make sure we have a few laughs along the way. This week we talk with Peter Sterling, the author of What is Health? Peter has had a long career in medicine and neuroscience. He has recently published in JAMA Psychiatry with Michael Platt on why deaths of despair are increasing in the U.S. and not other industrial nations, with many insights from neuroscience and anthropology. While that might not sound like AI, we do wonder what the role of technology might be for all of us to make better personal decisions about our health. Peter caught our attention with his concise and understandable description of how evolution, by optimizing for energy efficiency, has built human brains. We care about this for a couple of different reasons. First, his work is relevant to how we make decisions as modern humans. This tells us things that matter to us, where there are evolutionary mismatches and what we might do about it. Second, here at Saunders Studio, we care about how humans create meaning and how we learn and cohere with our communities, other brains, and by implication, other intelligences. This leads us to be naturally curious about how brains work, as well as how AI works. We are obsessed with understanding and designing for this interaction. We start our decision-making workshops with key insights from Peter's book because it really matters to understand something about how our brains are built and what makes them so different from AI. We really enjoy this conversation and we appreciate Peter's time with us. We think you'll enjoy it too. Peter, thank you very much for joining us. We're really excited to talk with you today. Thank you for inviting me, Helen and Dave. I'm uh, glad to be here. Uh, let's start with a little bit about you. Can you tell us a bit about your background? Sure. Um, I, was, uh, I was born in New York City uh, just at the beginning of World War II, and uh, I can still remember the blackouts and stuff like that. And after the war, we, we moved to uh, about 30 miles north uh, of the city to a small town, where there was still nature. There were birds and birds nests and snakes and insects and I, stuff like that. And I, I had my own little museum, but I used, to, uh, I used to go to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City and uh, just grew up there um, and uh, enchanted with it. And so those things sort of led me to study biology uh, in college at Cornell University. And there was another key thread uh, to my upbringing, which is that my parents were members of the uh, Communist Party of the United States. And, uh, and at that time, it was a legitimate political party that ran candidates for president and Congress and so on. And uh, so I was reared uh, singing union songs. My father had grown up poor in a ghetto and walking picket lines and opposed to lynchings and racial segregation and so on. And uh, that led me during the summers uh, in high school to work on a family farm in the Hudson Valley, which is, a, which is then a big agricultural region. And I still, at night, when I can't sleep, I, I, I repeat my chores. I milk the cows, I collect the eggs, and so on. And uh, so this family was also uh, left-wing, red, and, and musical. And so uh, Pete Seeger, who lived across the Hudson River, we used to come on on Saturday nights and talk and sing and stuff like that. So um, um, rural life uh, then sort of was a theme in my, uh, in my life. And now my wife and I, who was also a scientist, live on a small farm uh, in the mountains of Western Panama and amidst a community of Latino uh, uh, farmers and Nobe indigenous uh, agricultural laborers. So we're here half of each year and then we, we migrate uh, just following the the uh, winter, the, uh, the warblers back north. Uh, a little, they, they're a little bit ahead of us uh, to Massachusetts for the summer. I love that. It'd be it'd be like me 
moving back to New Zealand part time and being a godwit. <laughs> yes, following the godwits. Yeah. <laughs> what about yeah. some of your key influences? Yeah, well, um, my parents, of course, for you know, both encouraging my curiosity. My mother even would bring home snakes for me when she would find them. I mean, it was you know, pretty uh, pretty loose household, and then for their their moral commitment and moral conscience, and particularly my father was a very strong um, uh, leader in, in the family to doing doing the right thing, basically. And, uh, and then in science, I had four uh, key mentors, I would say, uh, a, a wonderful professor, undergraduate named Howard Schneiderman, who's, who's they're all gone, actually, um, and uh, for my PhD, uh, a Dutch neuroanatomist named Hans Kuypers, who was from Rotterdam and, and was chair of Rotterdam for many years. And, uh, and then when I went to Harvard for a postdoc for a couple of years, I studied with uh, um, two guys, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel, who, who were really pioneers at that point and went on to actually win a Nobel Prize. So... Um, and I, I learned from these guys mostly by watching and, and how they framed the scientific question, uh, how, they, how they answered it, um, and uh, the persistence needed actually to get it right and to get it published, which is a major, you know, a major <laughs> uh, challenge. So, uh, and I also saw, particularly at Harvard, uh, some behaviors that I decided I didn't like and I wanted to avoid. So it was a it was a uh, a good lesson in many ways. I I can relate to to that journey to a certain extent, but um, uh, that's quite a background. Um, I picked up what is health at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, and wasn't really expecting to um, to find it so. Uh, eye opening. You know, it, it, it's it, it's a it's a gem of a book because it brings together um, this incredible um, right down to the to the molecules building up to how we behave and make choices today. It's, and I want to. Congratulate you on being able to make something like that so sort of accessible and such an incredible journey. Um, how, how did you come to to put that together as a as an idea to go literally from um, the very very start of everything to um, the functioning of our society today? Yeah. Well, um, I taught I taught school medical students uh, for forty years at the University of Pennsylvania. And right from the start, and, and, and I arrived there in the late six, 1969, uh, in the middle of the Vietnam War, and was involved in anti-war activities, and also at the at the sort of the, the height of the civil rights movement. It was it had passed its peak at that point, but um, and I, I was struck from the start, disturbed from the start by what I thought is the fundamentally wrong sort of education that was going on there, and. Um, and the reason that it's wrong is it's all based on the idea of the body as something that's not connected to the brain. And this means that um, health <laughs> is something that people either get by good genes or bad genes or by, by you know, accident. And uh, what I saw, had seen in the civil rights movement, my active my actions, my activities in the, in the, uh, the black African-American ghettos uh, in Cleveland, for example, was that um, people had strokes, they had uh, hypertension, uh, they had diabetes and all, and all these really terrible things that I'd never seen in, a white, in the white communities where I grew up. And I realized at that point that my, uh, my grandfather had been uh, an immigrant in, and Jewish in that same ghetto, which had been a Jewish ghetto before I was there in Cleveland, before, before, yeah, before I arrived. And uh, he also had hypertension and an early stroke. And I thought, well, 
maybe uh, hypertension is related to social tension, segregation, and so on. So um, by the time I got to Penn, I was sort of, I had uh, uh, two children, and I was you know, starting my family, starting my lab, and so it was time to sort of move off the streets and into the library, and I began to look to, to read up on how the brain, which I was you know, studying pretty hard, would connect to all the parts of the body. And I found, uh, you know, I hit pay dirt pretty, pretty soon. I found, for example, that um, there are nerves from the brain to the kidney, to the, to the endocrine cells in the kidney that secrete hormones that, that uh, tell the kidney to pump in salt water into the vascular system and raise the pressure, that there were nerves to the, uh, to the pancreas, the insulin secreting cells, and so on. And these are, um, these are people, and this was the time when electron microscopy was just identifying these synapses on these endocrine cells for the first time. So I was reading original literature. This was not in textbooks. But when I realized, gosh, the brain innervates all the endocrine systems um, and the kidney and, and, and the vascular, all, all the blood vessels in the body have these nerve fibers wrapping around them in the heart. I realized, you know, uh, the brain really is controlling what's going on in the body. And to tell African-American with hypertension that it's just, it's just your bad genes and you eat too much salt is nonsense. Not only that, I mean, at that time I, I thought it was nonsense, but I've, t- I've come to I pursued this for 40 years now. And now uh, there's so much evidence that this is wrong, that the brain is really in charge that I think to persist in the idea uh, that the body is an independent uh, actor is really racist. Uh, it's, it's an embedded sort of racism uh, that has to go. And so, um, so to get back to the book, um, you know, by the time, so two things. Um, one is that I had worked on this material for many years interspersed with my standard, you know, investigations of neural connections in the retina and the brain. Um, But I I had arrived at this, as I've said so far, from the top down, from my political views and my social views, working my way down. And after I closed my lab um, around 2009, I began to write a book uh, with Simon Laughlin, who, who is a, uh, at Cambridge, a uh, British neuroscientist, a brilliant, wonderful man. And, um, and we, we ended up writing a broader book than either of us had, had in, intended, really. It's called uh, Principles of Neural Design. And um, uh, it took us a very long time to write. And... Um, and it's been very well received, and it's still it's, now it's really sort of caught on in courses and graduate courses and stuff like that. Um, MIT Press, and we published that in 2015. And one of the things that came out, uh, which is something that Simon and I had long been studying and, and were interested in, is that much of the reason the brain is so effective compared to uh, AI, for example. It, I mean, compared to a supercomputer, um, the brain fits in a milk carton <laughs> and it runs on 15 watts of electricity. You know, a supercomputer takes 20 megawatts, okay, in a, in a, in a warehouse. So we wrote this book um, to sort of explain, um, it's, you know, at some, some level, how, how this efficiency, where, what are the origins of this efficiency? And of course, the brain, uh, and, and so we came up with 10 principles of efficient, of efficient design, and I won't go into them now. But by the time we got done, uh, I, I had some con- confidence in my understanding of biology, a deeper level. And, and one of the things we found is that every time we looked at something, uh, some mechanism uh, and some principle, the brain carried it to to a level of essentially um, optimal efficiency. Biologists often say, oh, what do you mean optimal? Oh, this is nonsense. Uh, the evolution just does things good enough, okay? 
And uh, if you if you talk uh, about uh, optimal optimality, uh, people laugh and and uh, scoff at it. But in fact, so we spent a lot of time uh, going over uh, the question: what What does optimal mean? It means that something is functioning as good as physics and chemistry will allow. You can't uh, you can't defy the law of gravity or second law of thermodynamics, but um, or or diffusion. So, but but an enzyme that turns over its products as fast as as they can diffuse in and out can't can't be improved. That's as good as it can be. There are other enzymes that work more slowly, but that's because um, of other considerations. For example, uh, the uh, it depends on the concentration of substrates. How how fast an enzyme can work. So so many. Things in biology and neuroscience and, and the brain um, really are um, are optimized. That is compromises between two different competing demands. So by the time we finished this book, um, I, I had some confidence in you know this whole line of thinking, and uh, I, I you know I, I fiddled around for a while. Uh, uh, my wife thought I was depressed. <laughs> um, was trying to find me things to do um, besides working on our farm. And um, so I, I, I did try a few things, but I, I, I realized that I could, um, I could try to build up the story of, of uh, human biology uh, from the bottom up. And so that's what I tackled. And, uh, and, and so that's why it begins with optimal, an optimal genetic code, optimal enzymes, and, uh, and and all the, all the way up. So that, that's sort of uh, how I got there. Well, I think that's one of the things that really uh, that really struck me and really stuck with me is um, uh, how um, how elegant that whole story is, um, and how um, that contrasts with um, with the substrates that we that we build artificial intelligence on. It's just a totally it. it, it I encourage people to read the book because we can't go into the details of it now, but you're certainly left with this sense of there's such a big gap between anything artificial and anything biological once you get down to that sort of level. So it's it's a nice a nice thing to for people with who are focused more on AI to really to read about. But it, one of the terms that was new to me, um, I, I was familiar with homeostasis, but Less so with allostasis. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because it, it sounds that you were one of the the originators of the term. Sure, sure. Well, uh, let's start with homeostasis, which is the foundation of of all medical education. And I I checked before I started writing the book. I I checked in with the uh, the, the University of Pennsylvania um, uh, curriculum to see if anything had changed over forty years. And uh, it hadn't. I mean, it's sort of amazing. Uh, they've added more detail to crush the uh, minds and, and spirits of medical students, but but the basic foundation uh, is, is homeostasis. It's taught in every course, over and over, repeated the same examples. And the idea is that the body has mechanisms to hold all parameters constant. And if a parameter varies, deviates from its set point, which is sort of analogized to a thermostat, um, something, some, some negative feedback is engaged to bring it back to, to quote unquote normal. And so, and they give the example of your blood, pre- your blood glucose rises, uh, insulin is secreted, it, it reduces the blood glucose and so on. And this, this example uh, is given over and over and over again, and um, and there's no hint that uh, nobody ever mentions the fact that when you sit down, you smell a meal, you smell some food, your brain is already telling your pancreas to secrete insulin, so it'll be prepared. Okay, and uh, and and so the idea of homeostasis was named uh, in the. Th- early 30s by Walter Kennan, who was a professor of physiology at Harvard and a real contributor toward, toward physiology, 
But um, mostly they worked on anesthetized animals or animals where they cut off the brain. You know, they, they do a spinal preparation or a decerebral preparation. Well, not, not behaving animals. And so, of course, they were mostly looking at these feedback mechanisms and not the control of the brain planning and predicting. So who was doing that? Well, in 1904, Ivan Pavlov received the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for what? For his studies of digestion in uh, awake, behaving dogs. And what he showed was when a dog smells or sees bread, he starts salivating. And when he sees milk, uh, meat or smells it, he starts salivating. But he salivates different stuff, and, and, and his stomach starts to uh, secrete um, enzymes. If he knows it's going to, if the brain knows it's going to be starch, is predicting starch, it secrete amylases and starch uh, enzymes. If it if it predicts meat, you get proteases. And so the idea of this is predictive regulation, and uh, this Pavlov understood this then. And Cannon basically ignored Pavlov's lead, and so did the whole tradition of, of Western uh, medicine, really. And uh, so uh, when I started talking about this, everybody looked at me as though I was crazy, and except for Joseph Iyer. Joseph Iyer was a young biologist. He was a brilliant guy uh, who I met when I first came to Penn. And he, uh, he also was from a, uh, a red diaper, that is, a left-wing communist family. That's what we, call, we called ourselves. Uh, and to this day, when I meet somebody and I talk to them for maybe 10 minutes, I realize, ah, I say, were you a red diaper baby? Yes, yes. It's very, very easy to, uh, to pick out. So, um, so Iyer was already realizing this stuff about the brain, and he, and, um, and he was also... Uh, re- had been reading and knowledgeable about uh, other societies, the hunter-gatherers, horticulturalists, and so on. He began telling me how they live, and I said, no, I don't know. And when I first met him, he told me all these amazing things, and I said, no, no, no. But I would go to the library and read up, and I never found anything that he told me that was incorrect. I mean, he, he was a very uh, careful uh, researcher and thinker. So we began to work together and write uh, studies on this. We, we published something in uh, 1977 called uh, Stress-Related Mortality and Social Organization, which was basically a, a critique of capitalism, which is not that different, I think, from the book that Case and Dayton recently published on deaths of despair in capitalism. Um, many of the same points. And then we published something in 1981 called uh, The Biological Basis of Stress-Related Mortality. And um, it had all of this evidence, tons of evidence of the brain control of of physiology and and blood pressure, for example. And um, nobody paid much attention. Um, I talked about it in medical school. Medical students would roll their eyes, you know, my Colleagues in the faculty say, oh, very important, but nobody paid any attention. Um, uh, so in 1988, uh, we, we were invited to write a review, which, and, which I, I, I wrote with Joe's help. And um, at the end, I thought, you know, this isn't going anywhere. Homeostasis uh, needs to be challenged uh, with some kind of a name. And so I, I called up a friend of mine who's a professor of Greek philosophy. And I described to him, look, we have a system here. We understand that the brain is actually varying all of these parameters to, uh, to, uh, to maintain this organism stability. And so we need something to, to characterize stability through change. He said, oh, yeah, allostasis. So, so that's what we chose. And of course, um, it was a published in a fairly obscure place, but a, a pretty energetic researcher at Rockefeller, Bruce McEwen, picked it up and published a lot of papers on it. So that got some attention for it. Um, and then, um, so t- to make it clear, what homeostasis 
is correcting parameters by negative feedback, correcting errors. Allostasis is all about preventing errors. It's just like Toyota's assembly line slogan. It's uh, just enough, just in time. And this, as you can imagine, as as Toyota imagined, uh, uh, is a much more efficient way to do things. And, of course, the body is using 80% of the total energy, so it has to operate efficiently. And and that's that's about feed-forward action. Does homeostasis exist? Well, yes, because the brain makes predictions, but, you know, obviously predictions can be wrong. There are many things that happen randomly that are not predictable, and uh, so you need ways to detect them and feed them back. But the body, to, to base our physiology on error correction, wouldn't work. I mean, it wouldn't work. It doesn't work well in, in assembly, you know, in artificial control systems, and uh, it, doesn't work in, it doesn't work in the body either. So uh, this is catching on very slowly. The standard physiologist said, oh, oh, this is a new word for something we already knew. Cannon already said this. Um, you know, uh, we don't need a new word. People were pretty angry, some of them. And so I, I looked up uh, recently. So I, f- I published a, a review with Jay Shulkin in 2019 on um, in Trends in Neurosciences on allostasis. And um, I, I, I prepared by looking up to see, well, what did Cannon really say in the end? And, and he published his last paper uh, uh, on this homeostasis in 1941, and it was completely characterized as a cybernetic Norbert Wiener kind of uh, uh, negative feedback. And whatever he said in 1915 or 1920, I don't know, this is his final statement. It's, it's error correction. So, um, so uh, Grant, you know, People gradually switch from saying this is nothing new to accepting that uh, I have a point. And uh, now um, this summer, there's going to be a meeting, a facet meeting in, in uh, New Orleans. I see uh, titled Al- allostasis and something or other control. I mean, so it is it is it is it's not there yet, but it's coming. And uh, I hope that the book, by laying out the basis from the bottom up will will be a useful uh, uh, help. And one of the uh, the areas that that you particularly um, sort of describe and bring this all together um, to help the reader understand is in the reward circuit. And um, can you talk a little bit about all of this um, mechanism in terms of our efficient learning and decision making and governed by reward circuits? Sure. Um, maybe I could start a little bit, slip back one notch before, um, which is that one of my ideas in, in the book is to start by starting at the beginning and saying, you know, this layer was optimized, uh, single cell, single bacteria floating in the ocean were optimized uh, three billion years ago. Uh, they optimize their DNA code. They optimize their metabolic pathways. And uh, they couldn't do any better because they were very tiny organisms and they couldn't produce any more energy because their, their power plant was in their membrane. All right. This is a four billion year um, story I'm going to tell you in three minutes, you know. Um, so, uh, so what happened was, um, so we... They're, they optimize their basic metabolism, carbohydrate, protein metabolism, so well that it couldn't be improved. And so we have it today. It was conserved because that's what evolution does. It, it takes a good mechanism, a good idea, and it saves it, and it weeds out the bad stuff. So, so then there was tiny organisms, and they, they were limited because they couldn't produce more energy because their energy capacity, their turbine, was in their membrane and their cell membrane, and, and it, it could only increase as the, squ- as the square of the diameter, the surface area, and uh, whereas the volume of the cell would increase as the cube. So by getting its, its energy production inside the cell, it could, mul- it could increase the energy capacity by 
10,000 fold and made much larger cells with more genes and more proteins and so on and, and more organelles. So those were eukaryotic cells. And that happened, I can't remember, maybe a billion and a half years ago. Okay. Um, and by the way, people now have measured, scientists uh, got a Nobel Prize for measuring the uh, energy efficiency of the turbine that produces ATP. ATP is the small molecule that is the currency in the cell of all of our chemistry that raises the energy level to run reactions. And uh, it runs our muscles and our brains and everything. And the, there's a, there's a tur- special turbine that ru- is driven by a hydrogen ion gradient that synthesizes the ATP. And they've measured the energy input to this turbine and the ATP uh, output, which is known uh, energy capacity. And it's 90% efficient. Okay, so 90, 100, I mean, it's close enough. It's, you know, there are reasons why you can't get to perfection. So uh, this is amazing. This was already in bacteria. So the, the, the ATP turbine that we have in our, ce- in our cells in mitochondria, it, it's the same molecules, I mean, with minor, minor differences. Um, so, uh, so our energy producing, uh, um, when, we, when we burn glucose to produce AT- ATP, that also is a highly efficient thing. It was invented by the bacteria and then coupled to this, pro, this, uh, this turbine. So, and by the way, when I started reading about ATPase, I thought, yeah, ATPase, it sounds, you know, it's another enzyme. That's, you always call an enzyme an ase or a synthase. Uh, sorry, this is not ATPase. This is ATP synthase. Okay, it, it makes the ATP. Sorry, incorrect. So, um, uh, so you have this very efficient synthetic mechanism and um, uh, that's been conserved and then you have eukaryotic cells which have expanded by you know, five, five orders of magnitude or something um, and many, more, many new genes and, that we've invented at this point and then they started, they couldn't, uh, they ran into a limit because cells, small cells moving in, in, in fluid in, in aqueous medium can't swim. I mean, it's like a very viscous medium. It's like us swimming in molasses, you know. So the, the way they could get more resources was to stick together and then drift on ocean currents. And so that was the beginning of multicellular uh, organisms. And... Um, Gradually, um, they assembled and they fiddled around with various forms. Um, uh, and then they arrived eventually at a, uh, at a bilateral sort of or- multicellular organism that had actually complex organs, you know, liver-like things and muscles and stuff like that. And um, th- those needed coordination and they needed to find... Uh, to feed at a certain time of day, they needed to find out where the right pH was and right, the right where there were mates and food. Um, and these were uh, the first bilateral organisms were apparently uh, uh, a, a marine worm. And uh, I kept I kept reading that uh, our, our bilateral ancestor, you know, was a, a bilaterian and. I got to wonder well, what what did what did we look like back then? So I, I read and I found yeah it's just a funny little looking worm and it's in my book a picture of it um, and um, looks like to me something out of Sesame Street sort of googly eyes and um, so the worm was crawling forward and the best place to to put a uh, control system if you're craw- crawling forward is in the head you know so they had a brain in the head. It had adopted a molecular clock, which bacteria already had. And they had a clock because it it was an advantage to synthesize DNA at night when there would be less UV to destroy it. Uh, The worm used the clock to control its metabolism and when to when to move, and then it, there, were, there was a diurnal clock, but then there's, of course, a, a lunar clock to go out and mate, you know, in the full moon, which we just had last night. Um, so um, 
So we, we, we inherited the molecular clock from two billion years ago. The worm itself was completed by uh, about half, half a billion years ago. And, and what would send the worm around uh, searching for stuff? Okay, now we come to the reward system. Sorry, everything is, it needs to be a little... <laughs> No, we're loving it. It's like it's like it's like a a, a crazy bedtime story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, so the brain, first of all, is driven by a clock. Time to do something, um, and uh, it's time to get up and get going. And so there was some neural circuit, primitive neural circuit, that would send the worm out searching for stuff. Okay, and then the question is what to do when. Um, Actually, you could, you could say they, because this, these worms were probably hermaphroditic, so it was both he and she. Um, and um, so, so what Good to do... Good pronouns, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm full circle on that. Yes, yes. So the worm needs to know when it's found something good. And it could be the right pH, the right temperature, a mate, some food, and so on. And um, so the signal turns out to be, and, and it's looking for something, and, it, and, and, it, and it's, not expect, it, it's not expecting anything in particular. It's just searching. And so when it finds something that's positive, that's unexpected, uh, it's a surprise, it gets a reward. And this is called a reward prediction error, where you're looking, you're not expecting something, and you get something better than you predicted. And this turns out to be uh, mathematically, uh, com- you know, from computer science, um, the optimal way to reward learning. So th- that teaches when you get the reward, there's a signal that says, this is the place to stop. This is the place to return to. This is, uh, you know, this is a good thing here. Repeat it. Try to repeat it. And so, uh, I mean, if you f- if a worm finds food there, it's going to come back. Um, and um, and then anticipate. And we, uh, birds here in Panama, we uh, we wake up in the morning. We hear we hear uh, there's a beautiful huge bird called the motmot, and we hear him. Uh, he's calling us because he's telling my wife it's you know dawn is here and I want my banana. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so this is the mechanism, and because it is mathematically optimal, it was preserved from the worm all the way to the human. And so, and it turns out that the the chemical signal from from nerve cells that gives the reward to the worm is called dopamine, and we have the same signal. It's it's or more than a half a billion years old, and we don't know what the worm feels, but we know that in humans, when you get a little pulse of dopamine, uh, you have a pulse of good feeling. You experience this as a is a, uh, yeah, a pulse of satisfaction, of relief. You can, re- you can relax. Everything's fine. Um, and the problem is, of, well, it's uh, by design, you can't store the, the satisfaction or the dopamine. The dopamine diffuses away and the, the brain circuits go back to what they were doing. Um, and you're searching because they need to s- keep us searching for the next issue. I mean, if you... If you get your breakfast, you know, uh, you have to go out and find lunch. If you, if you finish some problem, you have to go on to the next problem. Um, and so if, if you just had a big store of dopamine, you'd sort of lie around and you wouldn't do anything. And, and uh, bad things would happen. So it's, 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 a, it's a built-in deal. You get the reward, but, and I mean, it's just sort of the stuff that you get from, from literature, you, you get the reward, but, you know, you're still driven on to the next thing. And it's really, it's in Genesis, really. Uh, uh, we had to get kicked out of Eden so we could find our, you know, find our living by hard work, you know, basically. It's, there's no way around it. Pleasure and motivation intimately tied together. Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well put. Much more, much more succinctly than I could. <laughs> One of the reasons we we use this story um, when we're when we're talking to people about making decisions is that it's so core to 
It's that something that's half a billion years old is still core to how we make a decision today. And um, the, that, uh, that the role of technology in um, the participation of technology in that circuit, whether it be uh, disrupting our attention into a small screen or whether it be making different kinds of choices about what to look at or read or eat or buy, you know, um, that how easily that seems to have been um, co-opted by technology. What's the, what's your view of that feedback cycle these days with uh, easily hitting a, a button on a screen? Well, yeah. Um, uh, I think, I think the, so people say it's co-opted, it's hijacked and, and so on, but I, I think the real problem isn't, the technology, the problem is that the sources, the natural sources of surprise have been eroded, okay? And um, that's that's modern life. I mean, so whereas we uh, hunter-gatherers uh, and horticulturalists go out in the morning and they get a, looking for a root or a berry or a rabbit or a dry cave or a warm fire, you know, comfort, food, um, they they have many possibilities of finding these things and getting the satisfactions, and they share them because that's that was part of uh, our two hundred thousand years of our own evolution. Is that when you have resources that are uncertain, you do better when the community shares them, and so uh, our reward circuits reward us for sharing. Uh, they reward us for giving. Uh, they re- reward, reward us for being gifted, uh, given to. Uh, all kinds of uh, things n- need for human society to be rewarded to make it work. Okay, And why we need to do that is another question, which probably you'll ask. But um, I think the problem is that when you go to a supermarket, um, there is no very little surprise, you know. Uh, one, one of the guys who works um, on, on this, Wolfram Schultz, who sort of was a big deal in this reward circuit, said, "Well, I I get rewarded when I when I find a, a good olive oil, and I, and I and I say, Wolfram, if you you know exactly where you're going to be, it's on aisle seven, and there's a hundred of them, and and you, if you had to live on that that sort of reward, you, you wouldn't. It's not it's not possible." And he was one of the guys who showed that if you record from a dopamine neuron in the brain, monkey brain, um, and, you, and you see it's firing in response to unpredicted rewards, you have this big spike. If you have the same nerve cell and you, you line it up on the rewards that the monkey was expecting, there's nothing. So I doubt that Wolfram Schultz gets the dopamine he thinks he does from uh, from uh, from aisle seven. No, I mean, when you go... And so it's the same thing with most industrial uh, modern things. You sort of know what's going to happen. And, uh, and since it's not a surprise, the only surprise can be an intensification. Oh, I got more. I got a new deal. All I can eat. Or, you know, you go, what I say is from a Mac to a Big Mac to a Whopper, you know. And because you have to keep upping the ante. It's true for all of the drugs that, that people take, um, uh, alcohol, nicotine, uh, opiates, uh, amphetamines, um, uh, cocaine. Those all work on this dopamine system to release big surges of dopamine. And it's great, you know, for a moment. And then it dies away because that's the way the system works. And not only that, uh, the next time you go for, uh, for a, a snort of cocaine, it has to be bigger. Why? Because our receptors for, for these molecules um, are attuned to the average level. And when you raise the average level over a period of time, the receptors turn down. This is the way all, all biological receptors work. They, they monitor the mean level and they... They turn up when the level is low, and they turn down when the level is high. It's like photoreceptors, which I studied. Um, um, you, if you turn up the light, 
photoreceptor sensitivity it turns down. If you turn down the light, starlight, it's, it's maximal. And so the, the society, and particularly uh, me- medical uh, thinking, calls addic- drug addiction, they call it substance use disorder, as though there's something wrong with the brain. I think this is completely wrong. It's, it's, way, it's a completely non-biological understanding. Uh, uh, people are, become addicted. Uh, and it's not a disorder. It's just exactly what you would expect that system to do if you were treating it to large surges of this stuff when it was tuned to a, a low average level. So, so none of these things are disorders. They're very hard to uh, unlearn once you tune it up. But um, I think the solution is that you need, the society needs to have uh, other activities that are rewarding, you know. And so, uh, I mean, if you try to treat a drug uh, um, addict as, I mean, the new National Academy report is out, so we've got to do better treatment. There was a Lancet Stanford report that came out last week. We have to have more treatment for addicts. It's very difficult to treat an addict. And the, or for an addict to treat themselves, and if they don't have an alternative to a, something that's rewarding in their life, it's impossible. So what we need to do is to uh, provide uh, and, and jobs. You know, a dead end job that you learn in ten minutes is is not going to be rewarding. Um, so what we need to do is to provide activities that uh, we once had during our evolution. Uh, for that are interesting and rewarding and socially interactive and positive, and uh, and that would avoid people turning to these uh, to these other uh, more artificial uh, activities. There's so much to unpack there. I'm thinking about like job automation and stuff. But carry yeah. on. You've got. Well, I, I wanted to go back to a point that you just made about um, sharing and the and the positive reward that we get from sharing with each other. Why does that exist? And what's going on in the, um, how much is that connected to the development of culture where we share things, music, art, those kinds of things? Um, What have you uncovered there? Sure. Well, my, my story about this is um, uh, that again, as part of, uh, brain efficiency, okay? Um, the brain early on uh, became more efficient by dividing itself up into little specialized modules, okay? So there's this motor, there's sensory, there's vision, there's hearing, but then the, the whole cerebral cortex of the human is divided up into roughly 200 smaller uh, areas, modules, and even within them, there's a substructure to divide them further, specialize them further. So uh, an individual uh, with 200 little areas that are specialized, that's a limit. He can't, he or she cannot fit more stuff inside his skull because it's limited. And, uh, you know, to to re-engineer a larger skull, you know, has all kinds of other problems. In fact, and it gets more costly. In fact, Neanderthal had a uh, had a larger brain than we did, like thirty percent larger in body, and uh, and we uh, we sort of uh, out competed them with a smaller brain. So so an individual brain, as effective as it is, uh, is limited, and so the solution that our species seems to have chosen which I document in the book, is that every person gets a somewhat different set of areas, okay? And so there are, there are areas to recognize faces, several of them. And, uh, but some people don't get them. Uh, Dr. Oliver Sacks, for example, is a famous you know, uh, neurologist and commentator, couldn't recognize people's faces or remember them. Um, when I when I was reading about this, I thought, well, maybe if so, if some people don't have any face areas, maybe some people are super recognizers. And I wrote around to a few friends, and I found, yeah, there are people who study this. Um, there are people who who are super good at this, and they get hired by Scotland Yard and the FBI to to look at crowds and find find you know uh, criminals, you know, from a glance at the side and so on. 
And the same thing, of course, is true for music. I mean, uh, m- my son just picks up a guitar and he plays. I, I have no talent at this at all. Uh, I mean, Mozart, you know, is a, is a super, is a super you know, musical talent. And so, um, so there's a distribution of talents, and some people are way out on one side or the other. And um, so, to so the community can potentially benefit from from people who are especially good at um, uh, hunting or gathering or navigating or map making or you know all kinds of things, healing, um, and uh, or helping people get along. You know, and and that is politicians. You know, um, and uh, you know they get a bad name right now, but I think there is a they're, and they're, they, they have an effective, uh, useful role, um, at least in many circumstances. So, um, so that's the idea that by uh, having diverse brains, I think people are calling it now neurodiversity, um, the community can do better than a community where everybody was the same. So... Um, but the problem is you get this big brain, it's like three and a half times bigger than a chimpanzee, which is our nearest surviving relative. Uh, and, uh, and um, you know, it, it, the big brain and, and these various differences between us leave us sometimes uh, lonely and disturbed and, and uh, personally upset. Um, I, I like to illustrate this with uh, Munch's uh, The Scream, you know, the, the painting. Um, and, uh, and it also leaves us with interpersonal conflicts of various kinds. Again, this is documented in Genesis, you know, first thing was Cain and Abel, you know. Uh, so this is very deep in our, in our history. And so, but of course, if, if that's all you have is, you know, interpersonal ma- personal madness and interpersonal conflict, you can't really get anything done <laughs> cooperatively. And um, so, so the question is, well, why did the brain evolve or art, capacity for art and music and sculpture and dance and very elaborate sex? I mean, there's no other organism that has all of these different forms and varieties of preoccupation with sex, it's, it's about um, uh, connection and, 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 and communication. And um, so all of these activities, music, art, dance, sex, and so on, all serve, they, 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 uh, they uh, release tensions, they, uh, they, they help us bond they uh, they resolve uh, conflicts and so on. So uh, so I think that is uh, the reason that this large brain invested so much in these non-economic activities. And and one of the things that comes out of this understanding is um, people in this country and you know much of the world think uh, they think about work, 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 work. And um, in the U.S. Uh, in, in Europe, there actually are pay, substantial paid vacations. In the U.S., there is no law in the U.S. that requires an employer to pay you for a vacation. So 25% of our population never has any time off, uh, except when they're unemployed or something. And so, um, but our, our, um, our species evolved with a considerable amount of, of uh, leisure time to do these other activities. And it was crucial to our, to our, uh, our social life and our, and our success, really. Now, now uh, people uh, you know, have basically uh, lost this. So uh, I, I think about it in, in, uh, in, in Boston. If you drive in Boston, traffic, uh, it's, it's, it's brutal. People are so angry. Terrifying. Yeah. So uh, and so, uh, imagine what Boston traffic would be like if everybody had a month off. You know, it would be a different place. You know, so uh, same for many other cities as well. So, yeah, I, I find that the, the 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 conversation about culture and sharing, um, I find it to be so deeply satisfying to have learned this. I grew up in a very musical family. Um, I grew up singing my whole life. Um, and there's always a positive 
I, I put it in the frame of I feel a positive reward when singing for someone to perform. But the strongest reward I've ever had is in choral groups, small a cappella groups. Right. where we shared with each other in the, in the production of the music. Right? And those created the longest standing friendships I've had in my oh. life. Oh. And I've always wondered whether it was possible that there was, is there some deeper biological thing that happened during that, you oh, know, yeah. that would help explain some of that. And so oh. I find your, what, what I've learned from you is just so satisfying from a lifelong pursuit to go, oh, I get maybe there is some signal in there. And that's why those moments when we were singing together were so powerful. It, you know, there perhaps there's something there. And that I find that deeply satisfying. Yeah, I um, mean, oh, almost certainly. I mean, it's the same sort of thing as why, why we uh, were so attracted by uh, the smell of smoked meat. I mean, my gosh, this goes right back. <laughs> to the cave, you know, uh, and, and all of these things that are profoundly appealing to us, why we take vacations by the sea or we like to, you know, a babbling brook or, or you know, all of these things uh, are very deep in our, in our, uh, in our neural circuit. And I can't yeah. show you exactly how, but, I, you know, this is almost certainly true. Well, it, and it makes a good sense when we think about in professional settings, we, we will hold workshops and help people through deep, you know, long intellectual journeys, but we start them by having people share something about sure. themselves, you know, and we have a different question based on the different settings, but that one change that we undertook years ago now in our process, um, opens everyone up. They, you know, they like sharing, they like learning. There's that, you know, you can see that process of tapping into the, the cultural community that we've evolved to have in order to bring different people together um, and those brains together. And it's nice to know that there's uh, to, to find a, a true scientific basis to that, you know, that it, it's not just a feel good thing. There's actually, well, this is why this feels That's good. Right. That's right. Yeah. I, I would add also uh, in my experience, um, the, the music, I'm not musical, but I, uh, in, in the uh, civil rights movement, I mean, music was a huge part of it. And uh, so uh, people say when I, I talk about my experience uh, in, in the Freedom Rides, for example, where we were arrested and, you know, threatened with some, you know, difficulties, um, people, you know, I talked to schools and people said, well, were you afraid? And I said, well, we sang. And, and singing, you know, really helps calm your fear. And I would say among the peak emotional experiences of my life was, has been uh, being inside uh, African-American churches where the music is, you know, stupendous and joining in singing with this group. It's, it's, uh, it's overpowering. Yeah. Um, one of the things that strikes me is uh, that, that just in this conversation, there's this aha moment for me is understanding how not all surprises created equal, right? Um, that it, it could be a surprise to get the same thing bigger, but that's not necessarily a very good surprise or a sustaining surprise or something that actually is anything other than just creating another problem down the road. And we think a lot about um, with, in terms of artificial intelligence, how we, um, how, how to join groups together, how to create connection that isn't just clicking. Like what is the true meaning of meaningful connection? What's the true meaning of surprise, if you like? And, um, can you speculate about what the positive applications of AI prediction capabilities could be and, and maybe a little bit about what makes biology so good? And we've, we've, we've had a, a really fast on-ramp to sort of these core aspects of biology that you've studied across your career. Um, we're really interested to hear what you would speculate on. Well, uh I have no problem speculating, but I know so little really about AI that uh, I, I, I shouldn't even imagine trying to tell anybody what AI should do. 
when you asked me um, uh, in, in the email, well, what does biology, uh, why is biology so, so good at, at some of these things and what might pay AI pay attention to? I hadn't really thought about that, but I, you know, you gave me a few days. And, and so here's what I would say. And that is, um, I think biology is so good at learning because it is built up layer by layer by layer, four billion years of optimization. You know, every layer is essentially perfect before you get the next one. And, and when you got this good natural selection, evolution says, well, what can we do next to add to this? So that it, it happens. So there's a really multiple levels. I mean, I studied brain, broad brain connections when I started, but I ended up studying, uh, you know, the, the uh, nanometer scale uh, uh, synaptic vesicles and how their re- precise release, you know, control, contributed to, for example, the detection of a single photon in the eye. So there's this 10 to the ninth scale, spatial scale, structural scale, and then, then t- in time there's, there's a you know, 10 to the 12th uh, temporal scale uh, of these things that, um, that uh, natural selection has, has made use of. And uh, so I think that's something. So, so that's something that AI somehow needs to come to grips with. The other thing is that uh, we've already talked about is that um, the the uh, the most effective thinking modules are social modules among humans, and they work because uh, everybody starts out with a, a different set of areas. We practice what we're best at, our talents, because that's most rewarding. So that's how you get a writer and a musician and a singer and a so on, carpenter. Um, and, um, and so that, that gives us, with our life experience, a tremendous diversity. And so when you bring a group like that together, uh, especially if you can get them to share and get along, then you have these different points of view to solve a problem. And, um, and, uh, and then you have... Optimally, you have some older people who with the most experience and some wisdom and a decent temperament to help bring people along, you know, to, uh, to solve, to, to resolve the different points of view, to optimize the, uh, the results of these different points of view. And so, um, uh, you know, uh, I mean, we, it, it's not, it doesn't always happen, but sometimes in some countries and some places, it's incredible. I mean, uh, in South Africa, uh, Nelson Mandela, my God, you know, he just took that shambles and for a brief period he, he got people together, you know, and now it's still problems, but this does happen. And uh, so how, how AI can do that, I don't know, but I, my intuition is that it has to do with different mo- modules and different different uh, approaches to the same problem. And, you know. I, I find one, one part, the, the first part, quite particularly intriguing because, as you say, we, our brains have evolved over billions of years, and the natural selection has led to a long-term learning curve of, of, of improvement and optimization. Whereas AI, it really, in its most advanced forms, have, has really only been practiced for about five years. Um, you know, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. Um, and it's all very narrow and optimizing over a learning cycle that might be a fraction of a second. You know, did this work or did this not? Um, whereas it's not, uh, we haven't even contemplated that AI could learn from uh, the arc of a lifetime, the arc of multiple lifetimes. Whereas biology has, by its nature, I feel like I'm you know, stumbling on my words here, but by its nature, it, 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 it obviously has optimized over many, many generations of people. And so yeah. that, that learning cycle is quite different. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. and yeah, and it's, I mean, there's, <clears throat> I'm, I've always been very skeptical of, of this idea that we should y- use AI to build, you know, another human. Like that doesn't seem to make any sense to me at all. We have hmm. humans already. Um, <laughs> but thinking through a more, a complex and nuanced view of what 
how AI would go about this a parallel journey in terms of the specialization, a parallel journey of what it, what it, an AI is good at versus what another AI is good at and how those connect. I think that there's, um, I mean, there's a lot of cross-fertilization of ideas between neuroscience and, and AI. Um, sure. And some of them work and some of them don't. I mean, um, reinforcement learning was a great example of something that did work. Um, other things are... are I just don't really compute because I'm out of my skis here a bit, but other parts of the brain like um, glial cells and things like that, no one really knows how to put that in a neural net. You know, yeah. Those kinds of discussions don't necessarily bear any fruit. But I think what's um, fascinating about this whole discussion is to, to, to be more integrated in how we think about what we value in AI and how we value AI putting humans together, that's actually kind of our sweet spot is, is trying to figure out how you'd put AI in this mix to right. help that coherence of strangers that you refer to. Right. And right. We, that, that's kind of where our, a lot of our questions come from, where they originate from. Um, what are you working on next and what gives you hope in this um, – politically charged, <laughs> fractured world post-COVID where every time you open the Times like I did this morning, there's a cabin crew resigning because they're hated on by passengers and there's, you know, road rage everywhere. It's just, it's it's not, not really a very pretty picture right now, but I know you're going to leave us with some hope. Hope. I, I, um, I'm, by nature, sort of uh, hopeful. Um, and so uh, I, I do have hope. Um, and I decided, actually, at the end of my book, um, I mean, it looked, things look so bad, you know, but is there, uh, what we need now is to change our direction very quickly. I mean, the, uh, the I published, you've seen, you know, the, the, the hockey stick curve of rising CO2, which started upward just at the moment of the introduction of the steam engine, which was a communally thought up idea. I mean, uh, Robert Watt got the, James Watt got the credit, but it was, he had a, he had a school of engineers with slide rules, you know, of calculating this and the gas laws had been abandoned. So once the world learned uh, to uh, read and write, uh, which is a topic we never got to, uh, but uh, it, it, things took off very rapidly, and it looks like an action potential rising the CO2, except an action potential turns down and uh, re repolarizes, and we don't see that yet. So I think we're in, we're in real uh, serious danger of a you know planetary you know disaster and, and social chaos. And so the question is, is there any evidence that anything can ever happen fast? That's good. So I chose one example, which uh, I, I recall from my, my life, which is uh, it, it, during World War, beginning of World War II in the U.S., um, there was housing segregation, there was work segregation, there was in the South, there was total segregation, there was lynching, there was uh, uh, black people couldn't vote, they couldn't work, they, the only work was sleeping car porters. Well, there was a sleeping car porters union ran by a man, black man named uh, A. Philip Randolph. And he went to uh, Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, and he said, you know, we're going we're gonna to march on Washington. We're going to really, you know, disrupt your war effort if you don't do something for us. And Roosevelt said, well, we'll start a, 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 a federal program for fair employment practices, and we'll do something. So, uh, so... Around 1940, by 1944, it took a while, and, and the armed forces were completely segregated. Um, and um, 1944 in Philadelphia, uh, the uh, the Philadelphia Transit Authority, whatever it was called, put two drivers, two black drivers. They trained them and bus drivers, and they put them. They hired them, and the white 10,000 member white union went on strike. And Roosevelt said, you know, if you guys aren't back at work tomorrow, I'm going to draft you. 
And um, and they went back to work, of course. <laughs> and so that was the start of of integration of labor in, in the U.S. It was a big thing. And that's 1944. 1948, Truman comes in, and one of the things he did right away was to, with a stroke of a pen, integrate the armed forces. And so no more black brigades and white brigades. It was, you know, mixed. And maybe this didn't take right away, but by the Korean War, uh, under Eisenhower, uh, early 50s, it was done. And so so actually in the U.S., the, the most huge steps to integrate society was the the military. So so now we get up to 1955, only 10 years, really. And that's when Martin Luther King and the bus boycotts started in, in Montgomery, and buses got integrated. By 1960, again, 15 years, um, these, these sit-ins in, in the South uh, at lunch counters got integrated. One year later with the the buses, interstate travel, which is what I was involved in in, 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 in the Freedom Rides. And once we started the Freedom Rides, there was a few little violent episodes, but, um, and John Lewis, you know, was beat up. A few other people were beat up. But by the fall, and we started in May, and by the fall, it was a done deal. And then the next year or so, it was a vote, the Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act. And so in 20 years, Really, I mean, we're still not done, okay? I mean, black lives still don't matter enough. But in 20 years, it was a huge uh, change, turnover from Jim Crow life and lynching to something new. And so, uh, and that didn't have a violent revolution. It had some passive resistance and Gandhi and, you know, Martin Luther King, great leadership, bringing people together. So... I, you know, I have hope that 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 could happen. Okay, if you ask me, do I have optimism? Uh, I don't know. I, I think we're really in danger of. Uh, I mean, after all, evolution is a record, a fossil record. You know, of species folding themselves in that couldn't adapt, and I think we we are in danger of. I mean, life will go on on the planet, but whether human beings will, I I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Thank you very much. This has been a, a fantastic conversation of biology and evolution and culture, and actually they all tie together in such an important way. And that it's a it's been a fascinating journey. Mm, really thank appreciate you very much. your time. Well, thank you. I've I've had a great time, and you you guys do very good job. I, I enjoy I'm looking at some of your other ones. They're they're really great. Thank you. Thank you. Stay